Welcome to the Nerdstalker Tech Week podcast update here. I am Adolfo Ferranda at Nerdstalker on Twitter, episode 29, and you are? I'm Greg Valoria, a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter, and uh, uh, back from Japan. Yeah, welcome <laughs> back, Greg. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'll go into some of the things. I, I actually saw some startups and some uh, kind of cool stuff up there in, in a remote area of Japan, but uh, awesome. it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that a little later. Okay. So anyway, what, what's this first story? I saw it uh, when I came back from Japan. Um, a, Apple to ditch Google Maps on iOS 6, which is uh, in -house, their in -house, uh, used to use their in-house mapping solution. What's going on there? Yeah, so this uh, this story comes from Boy Genius Re uh, Reports, thanks to uh, Mr. Okay. Dan Gra. Aziano here. So apparently what's happening is a new report from 9to5Mac suggests that the next major version of Apple's uh, mobile operating system, iOS 6, will feature an in-house maps application, ending the Cupertino-based company's reliance on Google Maps. Uh, according to the website's anonymous sources, the application is said to be similar to iOS's current Google Maps program. However, it was described as both cleaner and faster and will deliver a more reliable experience and enhanced 3D mode. Uh, Apple's in-house service will reportedly be based on mapping technology it, it acquired from purchasing PlaySpace, uh, C3 Technologies, and Poly9. Mm -hmm. So... Um, We've heard about this acquisition some time back, and a lot of people have been waiting for this sort of this moment to happen. Um, <clears throat> there's been all these rumors, such as this one, that in-house testing is has already been happening, and that the uh, quality is supposed to be great. I know uh, John Gruber just wrote a blog report uh, just saying that, you know, how excited uh, everyone is about this and how what a big necessity it is for Apple to move away more and more from Google, especially with all this ongoing litigation and competition from Android, right? And it's reliance mm, on uh, Google and, I see. and Google I also see. Ch charging now um, third party uh, uh, developers or whatever for use of the Google maps API. Right. Um, That's right. So they're, you know, they've, of course they sort of want to stand on their own two feet here, but the thing is like the delivery, the first, version of this has to be as good as Google Maps is Gruber's uh, argument also because everyone's already accustomed to it. You know, the iOS, their uh, mapping in, you know, lack of GPS uh, 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 quality uh, pales in comparison to what we enjoy on Android. We have direction, drive-by-drive, -drive, uh, you know, out-of-the-box technology right. on Android, whereas iOS, they've been, they've been lacking that sorely. Right, right. Well, I, I guess if I if I could like predict the future, integration with Siri is a must then mm -hmm. to go over what Google has, right? Mm -hmm. Because then, I mean, I, I think I could do that right now with Google Maps, is I could actually say a destination, and you know, it'll actually uh, plot it out on for me. But um, that's that, I think that's one of the must things is a really serious integration with Siri uh, to kind of. Um, make it complete, I guess. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's great. So, so there, I guess, I guess they have enough deep pockets to try to go after that and and, and replicate all that. You know, I guess it's good. Uh, you know, really, it, Google Maps is a monopoly pretty much on mapping right now, right? So I mm, think I think the world true. is in desperate need of a uh, a competitor, right? Yeah, I guess they didn't want to buy a MapQuest or something like that. <laughs> <Just kidding>. uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> don't even take, don't even go there, Greg. <laughs> Speaking of a uh, MapQuest like company, uh, Yahoo. So, Greg, uh, some breaking story here. We're now, uh, anyways, Yahoo. Why don't you just uh, talk about what's happening? Well, you know, I, I, it broke today. I was going to talk about kind of this whole uh, sordid tale of kind of like a a soap opera going on at Yahoo, but right, you know, reported today that. Um, uh, broke by Richard McMahon, as he wrote uh, from Read Right Web, uh, just reported that uh, Yahoo's embattled CEO, Scott Thompson, finally did the honorable thing and stood down. Um, Ex-president of News Corp's Fox Interactive Media Division, Ross Levinson, uh, has been named interim CEO. Uh, but l l let's recap what's going on, right? Uh, you know, Scott Thompson basically was, uh, you know, was accused of, or, you know, uh, of of cooking his uh, resume books, all right, with a right. Uh, computer science degree that no one could validate that he really had. So you know he went on in an email saying that hey, you know, I apologize for being a, um, uh, I guess in his words, uh, a distraction uh, mm -hmm. to Google. I mean to Yahoo. Excuse me, not Google. Yahoo. But obviously it, it was and then uh after that he he issues this statement on thursday which i can't even believe that the error was in his bio which is dude came from an executive search firm from seven years ago wow. come on you know yeah. come on you know <laughs> yeah. so i'm just you know i i, I what what a 
What a three ring circus that Yahoo's become over the last six months. And, and then suddenly, you know, um, uh, I, you know, and then he steps down on Mother's Day. You know, by the way, happy Mother's Day. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the past. So, you know, and what this whole thing was is that Loeb was looking for an excuse, you know, uh, whose company, Third Point, uh, has about 5.4% of the stocks and Yahoo to take over the company, right? Mm. He hasn't been shy about it. He's been issuing statements all week saying that, hey, I want my guys in here in, in the board, wants to replace a board member. And that's just the deal. And he's going to take over the company. Now, whether Loeb could run the company better, who knows? I think the whole deal is they want to get some value of the company before it goes any any more into the sand, right? right, right. So, and and I think that's really why Loeb wants to take over the company. I don't think it's for to make any really cool Yahoo products, you know, <laughs> quite this frankly. Is, and this I, is incredible, man. I mean, just when you thought like a company couldn't misstep anymore, right? I mean, it's just been a series of like just unfortunate blunders, you know, at, at this, at this executive level and this upper management level. It's just, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, the, the rumor was this, you know, CEO who resigned Thompson mm. right, or whatever Thompson was, yeah. was brought into essentially part out the company and, and sell it in pieces. I mean, how tough, yeah. you know, can that be? It's, it's interesting that an investment, you know, um, interest is coming in to try to upend that plan. You would think they would just, go along with that sort of bloodthirsty plan and just, you know, collect, but perhaps they, they have an even more lucrative idea of how to do that or, or maybe salvage what they can of this company. Who knows? Well, um, you know, if you read a lot of the stories, right, uh, let's not forget that actually Yahoo owns 42% of Alibaba, yeah. which we know is, is a massive player in the, um, in the China uh, market. Right. Mm -hmm. And, I, I believe everything I've read is that he's really not too crazy about uh, Yahoo ignoring that whole thing out there. So mm -hmm. in Asia in general. So I think that's part part of the things that I hear are the mm -hmm. rumors of why this guy is just totally unenamored with uh, Thompson. Mm -hmm. And now now uh, Levinson, who's, who's probably um, has good street cred as far as running a company as a CEO, um, I think it's an interim thing. I think Loeb has now got his way, and he's going to put his guys in there. So, oh, this is you know, who this knows? Is like, this let's, is like watching Homer Simpson for the fall next over the cliff. Yeah. <laughs> and hitting the cactus <laughs> exactly. at the edge of the cliff, yeah. and then the boulder, the boulder exactly. falling on top of it. <laughs> right, right, right. Let's just keep on going. Yeah. You know, the, and finally the, the skateboard know, hits him at the end of the head. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's a bloody mess at the end, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I think the next one was kind of interesting to me. Um, I thought that. You, you got something going here that yeah, the Facebook Americans spend more time on Facebook mobile than its website. I, I saw that this week and I thought that was incredible too. Yeah, it's a very interesting story. I mean, from the title of, you know, alone, it's uh, just numbers wise. And thanks to TechCrunch and Josh uh, Constein for the story. Uh, so yeah, so time spent on Facebook's mobile site and apps per month, uh, 440 one minutes uh, has finally surpassed usage of its classic website, 391 minutes. Wow. For Americans wow. who use both Facebook interfaces, according to the latest report from Comscore. And that's actually a big problem for the social network. And this is where the real interesting mm. part of the story comes okay. here. So Facebook usually okay. uh, shows four to seven ads per page on its website, but only a few ads per day in its mobile news feed. <sighs> So um, wow. that means it makes a lot less money, money when you visit uh, from your little devices. In fact, uh, this week, Facebook had to warn potential investors in its IPO that the more people who access it from mobile instead of uh, the web, the worse its business is doing. Uh, now Facebook must walk the tightrope, uh, inject too, too many ads in the mobile news feed and people mm. will stop visiting, wow. inject too few and it'll lose money. So no pressure. All right. uh, he says uh, there's just, <laughs> no just a half billion mobile users watching. <laughs> Well, guess what, guys? We're going to see more mobile ads coming up in the next six months yeah, after they yeah, go IPO. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know what they tried that, to do? is like no Zuckerberg brainer. didn't want to see a bunch of these banners going by on your mobile experience or whatever. So you, yeah. we had this thing of what? Spon in, and also on the website itself. So they had this sponsored content type, type of thing where it would charge mm, companies like to pay Twitter. for their yeah. content to, to be, yeah, um, 
whatever bring for, it onto the timeline essentially yeah, yeah more, uh, bring it onto more, the more and higher yeah higher ticker. That. so uh it's yeah. going to be interesting to see what happens on the mobile side if, if something like that will come along or or whatever but you have to re you have to generate revenue right yeah i i guess you know i'm getting used to this whole timeline and kind of a news ticker on the right hand side of facebook mm -hmm. uh, at least on the on the desktop version at least right. uh you know probably putting ads in there isn't going to bother me too much uh, quite frankly um you know I, I mean if you have two friends it probably is a is a problem but you know just like anything else when the when the um news feed uh, or ticker you know when you have about you know 100 friends like you have um it's not going to be a problem i think when to, to see that content but it's going right. to be interesting how they integrate it you know so yeah, yeah. um and and, and also cool. you know the mobile experience is much slower than than your web experience. I mean these networks, you know, it's, yes. it, it requires a refresh and this and that. Um, so it's not like yeah, this that's true. Ticker thing per se, like mm. a whole mm. lot. Well, and they've separated Yahoo Messenger away, right? Because you know in your in your desktop experience, it's in all integrated, right? Yahoo Messenger is just another application on top of the web application, right? Mm. Floats on top, and it's integrated with Skype now, mm. right? So so now on mobile, they're gonna have to. I think they've separated some pieces out so they oh, don't. Oh, you mean collide, Facebook but Messenger? Means you have to go, yeah, Facebook oh, okay. Messenger, yeah, right, right. I mean, it's the same. It's called Messages on on your desktop, right? Okay. Um, and, and they've separated out, but then you have to go to two separate places now to go, go access each one, right. To try to separate the noise from the, from everything, the chaff from the, the wheat, the wheat yeah. from the chaff type yeah. of thing. So that's, that's so really interesting. I, think, I wonder what other challenges, you know, this is going to sort of, you know, it's moving. What's really uh, also telling too, is it, this, this shows how fast uh, mobile and multi-screen is moving, um, you yeah. know, that, that they weren't even prepared obviously for for this to occur this quickly if there's Watch. one thing we love yes. is uh hearing about law from you so uh why don't you tell us this next story here what's this about yes. <laughs> keep I, us awake I, I i always yeah thanks buddy no i always keep the i, I keep right i do do a lot about law I, I hope i'm not boring you guys but i'm gonna do it again so there's a new law called the password protection act of 2012 now you know we talked about this on previous podcasts about how the government is trying to help us uh, by controlling certain things, and and we talked about you know how companies wanted our our, our Facebook passwords kind of check out the type of people we are right and before they hire us right. So now that's 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 lit a whole litany of um, lawmakers are trying to say okay, well that's totally wrong and let's go figure it out. So the Password Protection Act is, is is the last attempt to push through legislation aimed at protecting the passwords of Facebook users as well as other things. It's not targeted at Facebook users, but it, it really targets that, that situation that I mentioned earlier. So so the Password Protection Act would make it legal for an employer to, uh, uh, to – illegal for an employer to access any online information stored anywhere on the internet. That, that, mm. That's basically the, the whole deal of it. Mm. Um, it builds on an existing law, which it, you know really focuses on how information is stored rather than how it's accessed, which is kind of a key thing. Uh, the Computer Fraud of, uh, and Abuse Act uh, really uh, is the primary anti-hacking tool, which has been used by years to uh, you know to kind of protect private individuals from the in integrity of internet systems, right? So this is just kind of a, mm -hmm. in the same deal, and it's supposed to be technology agnostic or neutral if you want to call it yeah. and you know it's in the midst of it's going to be modified 10 million times by the time it 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 gets you know finalized but it was just introduced uh, i think within the last few weeks let's go on to the next one i, I think uh this one's really interesting um Ma mozilla and google accuse microsoft of unfair browser competition yeah yeah <laughs> what's going on there so now you gotta bear with me everyone on this story it gets a little technical and confusing thanks to Microsoft's wonderful marketing uh, naming conventions for their products. Um, I'd like to thank thanks, Ed, Bott, uh, Ed Bott from ZDNet for this story. Yeah. So okay. the summary is that Microsoft will restrict third-party browsers like Firefox and Chrome to the Metro Sandbox in Windows 8 for ARM devices, while treating IE 10, Internet Explorer 10, as an, in quote, intrinsic feature, unquote, of Windows. Um so what this essentially means, uh, some background here, right? So there's a product called Windows 8, 
right? And then there'll be another sure. product called Windows RT. Um, and Windows RT is also huh. available for ARM. So uh, just some background here on what ARM where that arm is a processor, right? It typically shows up in things like yeah. mobile devices, tablets, and ultrabooks. Uh, not all ultrabooks, but pretty much modern ones now, right? <clears throat> Everyone's using this except Apple, who makes their own devices, obviously, right? Currently, right, right. Um, so Mozilla and its primary backer, Google, say that it's not fair. What's uh, confusing about all this is that the desktop version of IE10 delivered, delivered with Windows RT isn't going to be a full-strength browser like its counterpart on the 486, or I should say x86, x64 X86, platform. Yeah. Right. Although desktop Internet Explorer 10 with Windows RT will have access to Win32 APIs, it won't be able to run plugins like Flash or Silverlight nor will it be able to hook into other apps running on Windows RT, except through the permitted contracts mechanism. <clears throat> mm. Microsoft's mm. own documentation seems to agree. Uh, in the building Windows 8 post, Sanofsky, Stephen Sanofsky, who basically runs Microsoft almost at this point, notes that the requirement for Metro-only apps on Windows RT eliminates many of the programming tricks used by, and these are common sort of things uh, pro programmers do, uh, used by Win32 app developers, including, quote, background processes, polling loops, timers, system hooks, startup programs, registry changes, kernel mode, all this stuff, right? That's really important. Uh, at this mm. late date, the likelihood that Microsoft will change the architecture of Windows RT to allow Firefox and Chrome onto the desktop is zero. The wow. release candidate of Windows 8 will be publicly available in, in uh, a few days, which means the code is already firmly locked down. Uh, the unanswered question is whether Mozilla or Google wants to elevate its complaints into the into a formal antitrust complaint, right? Given that uh, ARM-based Windows devices have a market share of exactly 0% right now. With no guarantee Minus that the zero, platform, actually. yeah, and no guarantee that the platform will succeed. <laughs> that seems like a risky strategy. Uh, the argument is especially weak given that uh, both companies have full access to the enormous space of four eighty uh, x eighty six eight x sixty four PCs. Given its yeah, own ongoing sure. troubles with antitrust regulators, Google might not want to be dragged into a high profile antitrust battle with Microsoft at this point, even by proxy via Mozilla, right? Yeah, so, sure. Uh, sure. to boil it down, <clears throat> uh, no Firefox, no Chrome, essentially on these uh, these ARM based devices. So, uh, wow, that's big. The question again is, uh, you know, is Microsoft pulling a monopolistic uh, move like they did, uh, sort of back to how they killed Netscape, right? All right. Well, you know that that could really backfire against them because it just makes uh, maybe users like you and I say, "Well, why should I even waste my time?" Right. You right. Know? <clears throat> you know, and, uh, I, if I can't get Mozilla or Google on there, why? And you, you know, know, and this is supposed to be the open operating system. Well, not open operating system, but operating system that runs on all devices, right? I mean, traditionally, right? Right. And so that it, that means it's open all kinds of developers to do all kinds of things, uh, <clears throat> and run on and create all kinds of applications to run on, on right. top of this operating system. The argument, right. you know, is that Apple doesn't do this, um, and and there is, if you think about it, there is no Firefox or Chrome uh, for the mm. iPad, right, or the iPhone. Yeah, true. That's true. But there are other browsers. Right on the right. iPad. Uh, Dolphin uh, mm -hmm. is one of them. Yeah, well, that's a pretty popular one these days, right? Mobile browsers. Um, but so. even uh, a lot of Windows pundits are saying, you know, uh, we wish Microsoft wasn't doing this. Oh, I see. They need any yeah, advantage they can I'm... get. Yeah, it smells of kind of like in the 2000s where they were just, you know, they 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 were the IE was the browser of choice, right? But there's a lot of a lot of other ones out there. So this conversation now is a little bit different than back in 2000 where it was only IE, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, wow. I, I mean, like I said, I, I think the choice for us consumers is: do we really want to deal with something like that, or and just let? windows do their own thing and just say hey, well good luck mm -hmm. you know and um you know just yeah it doesn't make any sense to me yeah, why yeah. they would exclude them you know it just doesn't make any sense yeah. uh, but oh well that's 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 microsoft for you that's right so uh greg you know. let's talk about chirpify yes what is that what is this story well I, I thought of, of interest was not that they got $1.3 million to sell music and concert tickets through Twitter, but wow. it, it's really the whole 
uh, John Cook of GeekWire kind of uh, – I saw the tweet from uh, GeekWire on this, and it really is – conducting commerce on Twitter, right? There's that big debate, you know, Twitter is just a news source. Uh, can it really be uh, commercialized mm -hmm. yeah. or monetized, right? So this company in Portland, Chirpify, uh, you know, announced that they got $1.3 million of first round funding to uh, from a group of angels, uh, from Buddy TV people to former, former Facebook executive and Hootsuite executives and, and Voyager, Voyager Capital. Um, to create really what they're calling Twitter commerce for digital content, you know, a new way of musicians sell and 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 uh, sell music and concert tickets via Twitter. So uh, here's how it works, right? Um, artists upload content to a Tripify dashboard and click to tweet. So it's 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 kind of like the Spotify thing where you know you're listening to something, you you have the right to share it either on your Facebook page or Twitter, right? And um, you could use to connect to your Twitter PayPal accounts. So that's the other twist, though. You could connect to PayPal accounts. Wow. And once linked, uh, once you reply to the link and, you know, put some kind of, you know, hashtag or code to it, uh, you could buy a certain track hmm. or you could get a, uh, a ticket. So it's kind of unique yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, they're using the Twitter kind of the Twitter ease to try to uh, make it uh, monetizable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So – you know, and then what happens is then they send you a secure downloaded link through your DM to try to uh, let you know that, hey, um, this is the code to download the song. Download right. the song, goes on your desktop or your mobile, and you're ready to go. Okay, well, I think we're ready for our typical thing, the speed round. <laughs> Yeah, no. Anyway, yeah, lead, hey, lead us in with the first speed round um, article. Yes, so uh, thanks to Liz Gaines from All Things D on uh, this one. So sources say that Google is close to buying Mebo, M-E-E-B-O. So oh, wow. Mebo is one of those, you know, I'm probably mostly known for its IM, uh, web-based IM. I've used it right. uh, a lot, and it's, it's really great. But they also came out with like a little uh, bottom banner sort of type of thing when you go to websites, right. and it kind of makes it social, right. and you can talk to people and message via the banner as well <clears throat> but um I, I think it's like around a hundred million bucks is what they're what they're offering for the company it's kind of odd because as, it looks like total investment so far six is around 80 million into it okay so um you know still pool i'm, I'm sure for for investors um what's a few million between between friends um but it looks like it's a quite a, a talent acquisition grab here because um these guys are fantastic, amazing JavaScript uh, uh, optimizers mm. and types and developers, mm. and, and I've seen them speak before. Mm. Uh, incredible. So I'm sure uh, Google needs help in that department, and these these guys make uh, perfect sense. So congrats to Mebo and Google uh, when that closes. So how about Good you, Greg? Good job, guys. Hey, my next speed round uh, is obviously going to be about LinkedIn, which I follow really closely. Um, and, and so for people who are LinkedIn users, which there are uh, over 200 million of them, uh, we got uh, some new features coming that came out this week, uh, kind of under the radar, but I think it's it's good to know at least. Uh, so I got that from uh, Technorati. Um, uh, Chris Morentis from Technorati uh, kind of sent that tweet out uh -huh. um, and 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 it's really cool there's there's two updates that you need to know about targeted updates and uh follower statistics which is really badly needed quite frankly for the last few years um people are always screaming about that how do i know who's following me so t targeted updates allows you to target certain people within your community based on either you know you could do company size industry job function seniority geography so on and so forth and then the follower statistics is really kind of following up what what uh facebook has always been good at but like update update impressions recent followers new followers every month total following follower demographics and engagement levels so read about that in our um backstories as well as the website uh we'll give you the links for that but I, that's my second speed round what's your next one man ah uh, so yeah mine is a really cool story coming out of mit so uh some some geniuses out of MIT really came out with uh, from Media Lab creates interface with magical anti gravity ball. Uh, we'll post some ah, video also and uh, nice. stuff too. But it's actually this metal ball cool. that is controlled by uh, magnets, right? So you literally yeah. put the the ball in between these kind of magnet type of things, and it hovers. Yeah. And not only that, but it moves around. Not only that, there's all kinds of different applications. They've turned it into a camera of sorts, so that you can. 
navigate through like miniature sort of buildings and things oh, like that. Cool. So you can uh, sort of, and then it creates like a 3D imagery for uh, to virtually yeah, yeah, see yeah. what it's going to look like within your uh, building and this and that. Um, all kinds of applications. I'm sure there's they're going to weaponize this thing. I'm sure, and you know, oh, I've been we've heard oh, about it's like uh, Star Wars. Yeah, Remember yeah, those little little orbs that used to come around, like <clears throat> yeah. get a picture of yeah, you yeah, in yeah, Star yeah. Wars or fighting with Luke Skywalker. That yeah, thing. yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, you so know. that type of thing. Also, you know, I'm sure there's talk about uh, speaking of Star Wars uh, aircrafts or vehicles. You know, if we could somehow figure out the the polarity of the Earth or electromagnetic, whatever, whatever, then you got yourself a. Uh, craft, Ooh. right, of some sort. Scary. Right? Craziness. Scary. But anyways, yeah. Scary. So Jin, Jin Ha Lee uh, at the MIT Media Lab Center of Bits and Atoms came up with the idea. Uh, watching nice. it in action is totally surreal. It's amazing. Uh, if you guys uh, you want to be uh, Jedi Knights, check it out. So yeah. All right. How about it, you, Greg? It, and it's, it, oh, man. Last one. Uh, son uses Twitter to find missing dad. Needs your help. Well, oh, yeah. I, there's been an update since that. Yeah. I, I thought it was kind of cool. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the fact that you know, I think the the key part of this story really is is that you know social media is just another channel, right? I mean, normally if you're doing missing persons, you go to the local TV station and kind of like, yeah, you know, try to issue a a a, a, a just a, a plea to get, find this missing person, right? This, so the son, using modern technology, uses Twitter and um, and as well as Facebook group. They created that, and and as well as a typical website now. But uh, you know, the dad has been missing for over a week now, and um, yeah, but I think it's gone from a homicide investigation to just you know uh, maybe a, a person has just walked out on the family. It turns out, but oh, but well, I think yeah. the key thing here, key thing here is that the you know the use of different sure. media media channels to do, handle something like that. I thought it was kind of interesting. So that came from all Twitter and, uh, you know, thanks to them about uh, breaking that story. I mean, it's been all over uh, Huffington Post and uh, other places, but, but I think, um, you know, read about it and, you know, maybe you might find the dad. I don't know. Right. It'd be kind of cool. So anyway, all right, right into tip uh, time, buddy. Right tip into time, Greg's tip. tip. Time. Well, I was in Japan last week, guys, and I got my cool hat as well as Adolfo and and Matt Gonzalez from SF New Tech has copied this hat. I, I know, you know, quit copying me, guys. But anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, Kaku, uh, which is a really interesting application. I don't know if you guys know about Kaku or not, but it, it's it, it's it. It, it, I visited their um, their startup uh, in Fukuoka in Japan when I was there uh, during Golden Week, what they call area called Golden Week. It it, it it operates a collaborative web service that used to create diagrams, charts, and and mind maps. Right. But what's cool now awesome. is that you could use it for collaboration by creating a Google Plus Hangout, and I thought this was kind of neat. Yeah. So like, let's say I was in Japan, like I was, yeah. and uh, you know, Dolph was saying, okay, how how are we gonna you know, collaborate on getting some of these uh, the new process for, um, let's say, uh, interviews, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, he w uh, Adolfo would create a hangout mm -hmm. and use Kaku to try to do a diagram. I could drop things into the diagram myself cool. uh, being 5,000 miles away, and you could use it for collaboration. I thought this was kind of cool. Uh -huh. And uh, that's my tip of the week. You know, they have about over 400,000 web app users, wow. and uh, this will just increase it uh, oh, dramatically. I love that kind so. Of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was kind of cool, easy to use too. Yeah. So commoditize uh, check productivity. It out. It's so great. Yeah, absolutely. Check it out. Um, they really have a neat app there. And so, what's your tip of the week, my friend? Instacorder. So, Instacorder is a no frills app for emailing yourself voice memos. So, thanks to Shep McAllister from Lifehacker for this huh. tip. Um, so this is an iOS application. Instacorder is a dead simple app that will instantly email voice memos to yourself for review and organizing on your computer. Uh, the first time you open the app, you'll be asked uh, for your email address, which is key. <clears throat> After which you'll simply hold the huge recording button to enable your uh, the microphone. So it's essentially the app is one big button. You hit click, right, the big button, and it records. As soon as you let go, so you hold it down, and as soon as you let go, the voicemail is instantly sent to your email. Uh, so you know the first thing I thought is, well, I could do this with Evernote. Why would I? Why would I do this? So uh, right, so right, while you can right, always use right. this app uh, like Evernote to create and uh, organize your voice recording. Sometimes there isn't time to categorize and title a new note. Instacorder excels by simply focusing on the recording, leaving you to sort and organize a memo once you get back to a computer. Uh, Instacorder okay. is free, but uh, there's a 99 cent version. will unlock some uh, similar one-touch functionality for emailing photos as well as stripping out the ads. So uh, give it a go. You know, It's a good little option. 
You know, that, that's kind of cool because I, I was always kind of thinking about like when I was doing like Google settings this week, mm -hmm. like uh, it asks you for kind of like a voice bit mm -hmm. that you want. Maybe that's one of the things you could use for your voice bit mm -hmm. for your introduction. You know, a lot of audio introductions are available now on Google. So, cool. um, you know, they could hit that and say, you know, you could have your voice pop up and say, hey, I'm, I'm yeah. Greg Laurie from Nerd Soccer. You know, well, yeah, listen to me. That's right. That's right. Check out my awesome hat <laughs> that, you know? that you can't see yeah, right now right. because you're listening to my audio. <laughs> but take my word for it it's anyway, awesome take my word for it yeah it's awesome uh hipsters yeah. um <laughs> um hipster hats anyway uh so what's going so, on man that's kind of cool what we got hey, coming up here um we just finished up a great week of sf new tech and now uh looks like uh tell us about the maker fair I yeah think we're, so we have we're, great we're, we're a media partner so yeah fantastic <sighs> news here riley has uh approved us to uh again for a second year in a row to uh to a cover uh, Maker Fair. So Maker Fair, if you guys don't know, is a, an O'Reilly event. Uh, I don't know if you know Make Magazine. It's all these incredible enthusiasts of people, DIYers, uh, kids, uh, everyone. Uh, you know, every generation, every you know uh, uh, gender uh, should come and check this thing out. Especially if you're in the Bay Area, please uh, check it out. Uh, May nineteenth and twentieth. Uh, tickets to the early bird tickets are already sold out. It's right around the corner. You can get more information at MakerFair.com/slash/BayArea/slash/2012. Um, so we really are excited about this. Can you wait? Can you, can't wait for it, huh, Greg? Oh man, this is really cool. Yeah. Um, there's fantastic it, events. You know, I mean, Legos there. Everyone's there, you know, like doing amazing stuff. Oh, I love Google, Lego. Arduino. I just love Lego. <laughs> wow. Uh, that's cool. Well, you know, I, I think, um, I think, uh, we deserve to go there, don't yeah, yeah. we? <laughs> Here we come, San Mateo Fairgrounds. It'll be cool. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The powerhouse of all venues in the Bay Area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway uh, let me let me uh, close off the show by saying, you know, please use our hashtag, uh, NRDSCK, if you want uh, us to mention uh, an article that you feel of uh, significant importance, well, some importance, whatever, um, or or listen to us on iTunes audio and, 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 and video and rate us. Um, you know, that always helps us quite a bit. And, or catch us on the YouTube channel, Nerds stalker tv um and those are typical channels you can find us as well as other video channels that uh, our our leader there next to me uh adolfo ferrando has is, is generously put on those channels so you can catch us on all many channels and anyway um i'm greg glory catch me uh, at uh on twitter at social greg uh, um, or you can catch me uh, via email uh, social greg at nerdstalker.com uh, and also I wanted to give a shout out to um, uh, Megumi and Hashimoto-san who were gracious hosts for Kaku uh, in Japan for me as well as helping me through some vacation in Japan. I just wanted to give them a shout. Anyway, and how can they reach you, my friend? Hey, you can find me on Twitter at nerdstalker, all in word, or e give, feel free to give me an email at adolfo at nerdstalker.com. Cool. Hey man, Greg, cool. thanks a lot, man. Another great week. Thanks everyone Later. for listening yeah. and watching. Okay, anyway, be careful out there. <laughs>